Hello, welcome to Emotional Badass, where Moxie meets Mindful. I'm your host, Nikki Eisenhower, life coach and psychotherapist. And on today's episode, I'm discussing simple tools and strategies to drive focus and creativity. Many of us can be struggling with attention and focusing struggles due to tech and the normalized, fragmented, and disjointed ways that we communicate now. Once, not that long ago, it was just a phone or a letter, y'all. And then we added voice recorded messages, then we added beepers, then we added cell phones, then email, then countless apps to direct message us into oblivion. I can't keep up even with paid part-time help with the messages that come at us from the internet. We deal with having to complain to customer service. There's so much attention to detail that we're having to do in this modern life. We are living in a world that goes 100,000 miles an hour with more and more and more detail-oriented responsibilities. If we add the effects of a gambling slot machine like social media in our hand, on our phone, working our brains, not to mention the effects of blue light on our sleep, no wonder we are more distracted than ever. This is why, in large part, I reject putting the disorder on the person when we're talking about attention deficit. I prefer to put the diagnosis on the circumstances that we are contending with and living with as a society, and then as each individual in our own lives. Also, if you're parenting, you aren't just thinking for yourself or for your partner or spouse. You're quite literally thinking through the entire life and existence of little children The parenting demands and expectations are mind-boggling today compared to previous generations. Previous generations' parenting strategy was a whole lot of go outside and play and come back, I'll see you when it gets dark, which is an entertain yourself, have your own kid life, very separate from adult life strategy. Now in modern parenting, the expectation is to be constantly involved to attend to almost every thought, every feeling, every event at school, every sporting event, every dancing event, every event under the sun, to have children entertained or enrolled in activity almost constantly. Some European studies are even suggesting that this Americanized or Westernized go, 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 go child rearing is showing a similarity in children's brains that mimics what we see when we look at a war vet's brain who has been on the battlefield. The accidental side effect of throwing so much activity and entertainment at our children is that we're valuing speed. We're valuing doing, doing, doing. We're valuing experiencing, 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 which as an accidental side effect means that we're not so much valuing slowing down. Less is more. Focus as a practice, containment of body and energy and mind as practice. We're not teaching centering. We're not teaching quieting. The art of doing nothing is is more a joke than a real serious undertaking. And it's affecting our collective and individual mental health. A lot of my clients have the realization at some point in our work that they're working with me to help them slow down, to do less, to just be where they are in one spot, to practice a reasonable focus day to day, moment to moment, to be able to be more still centered, productive and creative in this life. It can feel backwards from this go, go, go culture to integrate an understanding that slow is the secret fast. The more that we slow down, spend time meditating, the more productive, the more focused, the more creative flow we get to experience. 
So here are some simple tools and strategies that I use pretty much constantly to drive focus and creativity and productivity because I am by nature a creative scatter brain. It was very, very hard for me to get through college. I could get good grades. I could figure out how to be a good test taker, but managing all of the different elements of getting through college or modern life is very, very hard for me. I have a very, very distractible brain. I have a lot of ideas and so many highly sensitive people are very, very similar. We have sensitive nervous systems. We are very nuanced and fine-tuned observers. That means if the wind blows, my focus can be drawn to it. Okay, That's really, really beautiful if I'm just flowing or if I'm out on a hike or I'm out in nature. But in terms of adulting and getting things done, it's tricky. So let's get into some simple tools and strategies that you can start using right now if you're not already. And of course, I'm going to start with meditation. And I hear and feel groans and eye rolls when I suggest meditation now. Why? Well, meditation is so much more than our limited Western assumptions of clearing out the mind, of thinking of nothingness. This is just one form of meditation. I was taught that this type of sort of nothingness, clearing the mind meditation, is referred to as vipassana. But that's not all of meditation. Meditation is not just a nothingness. Meditation is about training the mind muscle to be in one place, to be still, to be focused. This is something we need as a balancer to what I just previously described as what our society and work lives are doing to us, to our brains, to our well-being. There's guided and visual meditation. I think this is going to be the year that I finally get my visual meditation deck out into the world. All the art is complete and it's a visual meditation technique that I use. There's progressive relaxation where you focus on the body. I use a lot of imagination if you've listened to my meditations, which reminds me, I've got to work on a meditation for the show. I haven't done one in a while. So I use a lot of imagination to help engage the inner child, to help us offer healing and peace. The more that we meditate, the more that we strengthen the ability to focus. So when I sit down and tell myself to focus, when my meditation game has been strong, it's as if that door to focusing opens up with greater ease. It's like there's a chair and a beautiful desk sitting right there waiting for me. Because of that mind muscle focusing, that meditation is. Meditation is a mental gym. Anybody who lifts weights or goes to some kind of workout class at a gym, you build up. You build up muscle over time. And when you do meditation, you are building up that focusing muscle, that mind muscle over time. If you feel sheepish about jumping into meditation or you haven't really found your style, you can always go jump over to our website at emotionalbadass.com, click the store button and download our meditation packs. Those have all of the intro music, the outro music, my explanations or my discussion stripped down. So it is nothing but the meditation itself. A lot of you out there use these stripped down meditations to just fall asleep, to listen to multiple meditations, just to help reprogram your brain, to help your mind slow down, relax, and receive calming guidance, that invitation to be still and peaceful. So those are always available for you in every season. We do another pack. We pull from the previous season. So you can go there and Patreon people Grab your coupon if you're in Patreon before you grab those meditations on our site. All right, my next tip that I have for you that can drive focus and creativity and ultimately help you feel more satisfied and productive in your life. And isn't that what we really want? No matter how different we are as people, we want that kind of life satisfaction. We want to feel on top of things. We want to be moving our goals, our dreams, our desires, our professions forward. 
The next tip I have for you, believe it or not, is a gratitude practice. So why gratitude? How does that possibly play in to focus and creativity? Well, there's a huge, amazing, beautiful shift that's available when I shift from I have to do something to I get to do something. And this is a gratitude in practice, in action. This is a game changer for life, y'all. It's so easy as a human being with a consciousness and an ego to be ingracious, to be almost in anti-gratitude. It's easy for us to complain. It's easy for us to see the ways that life is unfair or overwhelming. And that's what kicks off a whole lot of overthinking inside of us too. This concept of have to versus get to really came into focus for me. It solidified way back when I had a little teeny tiny yoga studio in Houston. I was rushed. I was overworked. I was having problems in that business because the partnership that I had gone into business with was not right for me. And I was frustrated. I was annoyed. And I was basically resenting having to stop what I was doing to sweep the floor. And all of a sudden, this idea swept over me that I didn't have to sweep this floor. I got to sweep this floor. It was a gift that I was able to sweep this floor. And that immediately made my body feel calm and grounded. I felt gratitude in my heart and I felt softened. Then it flowed out of me as if some kind of angel or magic was guiding me. It creates a cascade of gratitude. I could be grateful for my legs and my arms that are capable, able, and willing to sweep the floor. I was grateful for the privilege of owning this broom, this space, this floor that gets dirty. I was grateful for the dedication that I felt in my heart, the desire to make that floor lovely a gratitude for the students that would come to practice with me and my teachers, I felt grateful that I could create a clean, clear, swept up space that welcomed my students. This shift brings us from mild resistance or even full-on resentment and low vibes to the higher vibe of generosity, of service, of taking care of ourselves, our spaces, and each other. That's why getting to do something is such a beautiful shift from that feeling put upon funky, heavy weight of I have to, or I should, or I must. No, I get to, and I am grateful that I get to in this very moment. It is something I use every single day of my life without fail, because that's life, y'all, isn't it? Every single day gives me the opportunity to either be annoyed, complaining, and irritated, or to sink into this gratitude practice that whatever is in front of me right now, I am grateful that I am alive and I get to do this. All right, next tip. Food is mood. All right, what does that mean? Well, for me, part of what I've figured out in recent years through elimination, dieting, and experimentation is that I figured out that sugar really agitates me, and then it makes me crash. Then it makes me just want to take a nap. It's like my mind can't focus on what I need to be doing or the task at hand. It just wants to keep pulling me towards a sofa or towards a bed, towards the position of becoming horizontal and drifting off. Sugar is probably the thing that I felt the most addictive pull. I mean, if I drink a Coca-Cola, y'all, I, I feel like a sugar monster awakens inside of me and all I can think about is more sugar and more sugar and more sugar and more sugar. I've also figured out that weight gives me significant brain fog. It gives me inflammation. It just makes me feel icky. That kind of brain fog it makes me feel dull, 
idea less. It's like my sparky, normally excited idea maker is all of a sudden underwater. Honey in my tea and big, juicy, fat, medjool dates. Those are the sugars that I have that don't seem to spark cravings and actually satiate me. If I bake, like the last thing I baked a few weeks ago was a gluten-free banana bread with coconut sugar, and I reduced the sugar by at least a quarter or a third in most recipes if I bake, and I intentionally pair any kind of baked good with a protein, and that helps my blood sugar stay stabilized, which helps my mood stay stabilized and lifted. Lately, I've also eliminated all seed oils, which makes me very sad sometimes because it means that I can't run out and just grab some French fries from anywhere. I have to be more selective and picky, and that makes me feel even like a pain in the ass to myself sometimes. But I've turned this into a gratitude practice too. Since COVID, the restaurants in my area have become wildly expensive, And if wildly expensive restaurant food doesn't impress the hell out of me, I mildly resent the expenditure and the experience. It feels wasteful, unfulfilling. As cost of everything has gone up, even most of our old favorite restaurant spots, we've noticed food quality and portions diminishing. I have a lot of compassion and empathy for the struggle of restaurants, I basically got through my youth working in restaurants and bars, front of the house, little back of the house too. But my gratitude practice says I am so grateful that I get to stay home. I get to save money. I get to create delicious, high quality foods that totally nourish me without sabotaging my mind or my body. I make a mean home French fry, y'all. So the more that we learn to heal and really respect ourselves and we understand that food is our human fuel and when we put better fuel in, we get better energy out. When we just allow this simple truth and we work with food, we experiment and we really figure out what fuel our body really needs to run on, of course we get better focus. Of course we have better creative flow. It's worth it to me. The benefit of feeling so much better in mind and body is worth all of those changes. And that's what I say to myself when the critical voice really, really, really makes me feel like this is too much of a pain and I should throw out all this food stuff and just kind of pig out on whatever. There's so much abundance when we allow ourselves to look at what we can have instead of over-focusing on what we can't. There's a little bit of grief there, but that's okay. I can go through the grief of letting go of some of those old comfort foods that accidentally screw me over. I can grieve them and I can find swaps. I can find substitutions. All right, next little tip, the tool of the timer. And I know a lot of you out there know about this tool. Anytime I suggest it to somebody, they usually say, oh yeah, that is a really great tool. So I just wanna really advocate that you allow yourself to use this most simple of tools because it's kind of like taking a breath. It feels so good. Try it right now with me. Just stop and take a really deep, full breath. You feel how nice that is? How respectful of this body that carries us around every single moment? It's so simple and yet it's such a profound peacemaker for us. So this simple tool of the timer, very similarly, It's so useful, but it's easy to devalue as a real technique. So we want to help ourselves have more of the simplicity. This is how we get out of survival mode and start to thrive more, y'all. It's okay. It's a certain amount of right. It's a yes to bring in tools that really do bring simplicity and ease. Sometimes when we've had a lot of struggle, a lot of heartache, maybe a lot of trauma, maybe a lot of neglect. That's the pattern we're trying to break, that it's always been so hard. So when you wonder, hey, why am I not using that very simple tool? I want to encourage you to shift automatically and just go right into using it. The way that the timer works to help focus, 
is just putting it on for a very small amount of time. Now, it sounds kooky. And if anybody's watching me do this, they're likely to look at me and go, Nikki, what the hell are you doing? Why are you doing that? It's okay that they don't understand it. If I'm washing the dishes, if I'm cleaning the kitchen, if I'm doing laundry, if I'm picking up the dog poop out of the dog run, whatever sort of chore or task that I'm doing, it is so easy for me to move through the house and get distracted. I can wash three dishes and then turn around and want to put the food away and then remember to feed the cats and then I see cat hair and then I want to vacuum up the cat hair and it's just distractibility on steroids and I don't ever really feel accomplished. So the timer is my friend here. If I put five minutes on a timer, 10 minutes on a timer, and I just keep repeating that timer, every time it dings, it reminds me to finish the task that I'm on. So I'm washing dishes, that timer goes off after five minutes, I reset it again for another five minutes, and that ding is like, oh yeah, keep at these dishes. And I do that over and over and over again. Y'all, especially if you're really smart, especially if you have a lot of emotionality, that combination, we have a lot of thoughts. So that timer is just a grounding force. It dings, it goes off. And it brings us right back to this present moment instead of distractibility land. All right, my next tool. I think this is my only limit tool on this list, but it's a very important thing to limit. Limit any social media that scrolls. I can hear the groans there too. I know that you feel the addictive quality of that. I think we all really do if we're honest. This is a place to really bring in some self-discipline. If you have to keep your phone in your car, if you have to lock it out of your room, if you have to get a lockbox to put it in after a certain time, to give yourself some time and space. It's actually one of the reasons why I really like being out in nature and on hikes. I am so looking forward to spring and summer hiking because no service, I don't look at my phone, we don't look at any social media when we're out in the woods or we're camping. When you're looking at social media that scrolls, that act of scrolling actually trains your brain to look for something new every few seconds. Can you hear how that is the direct opposite of meditation? This is why meditation is the balancer of all of us having eyeballs on social media. And for some of us, the only reason I'm on it is because this is my business. I have an online business. I have a podcast. So it's really easy to justify looking at it and looking at it, especially when part of your business is related to that. Even then, I'm a huge advocate for my entrepreneurs out there to especially put down that phone, put down that scrolling. And if you are scrolling, at least allow yourself to have that balancing meditation. Maybe that becomes the self-talk of permission. All right, I sure looked at social media a good bit today. Let me balance that by closing my eyes, centering, doing a little 10 minutes of meditation here and there. That's the great balancer. Next tip, Brain FM. Y'all, I love Brain FM so much. I interviewed the CEO on episode 178. So if you want to go listen to some of the science behind Brain FM, y'all, it is science backed music that works with our brain. Okay, it is brain training. When I get my memoir finished, I'm realizing I'm going to have to add Brain FM into who I thank because almost every single word that I have written has been while I'm using the focusing function of Brain FM. In fact, I use it to write most of the episodes. I also use it to meditate because it gets my body and my brain into that meditative state with so much more ease. So it's a helper to my meditation practice. It's a guide. It's a way to go deeper with more ease, more swiftly. It also has a sleep function. So when I'm struggling to fall asleep, it's often a tool I go to, just popping some earbuds in and just laying down and allowing that sleep to get my brainwaves into that sleep mode. 
allowing that music, that sound to train my brain towards easier sleep. If you would like to try Brain FM, you can get a free month and 20% off brain.fm backslash emotional badass. This link will be in the show notes if you want to catch it later. My next tip, prioritize sleep. And I know that's easy to say and it's hard to do, but sleep really affects everything else. It is the foundation. Our houses have foundations, right? You cannot build a strong, sturdy house on a screwed up foundation. Our sleep is our mental health and our physical health foundation, especially if you are highly sensitive, if you are healing a traumatized nervous system, we need good sleep like we need air. It's just that if we don't get air for a few breaths, we know damn good and well that we better get some air right now. Sleep's a little different. So it's easier to sort of convince ourselves that the sleep need is less than the air need, isn't it? Sleep is a mega priority for me, and it has been a cornerstone of my body being able to let go of so many physical symptoms associated with what was my lifelong PTSD. I don't believe I could have healed the constant anxiety I was in and the massive startle response that my body would exhibit. There's a reason that sleep deprivation is a torture technique. We can become psychotic if we don't sleep for a few days. We have such a hustle culture that has created an ego-driven boasting of grinding without sleep. And we really can endure with less sleep. I endured with less sleep all through my adolescence, all through my 20s. But is that our best strategy to endure If we've been enduring life, we've really been on a survival mode. So this just brings me back to Brain FM to help us sleep, to help us wind down. I very much believe that a very big problem with our mental health collectively and individually is just not having a culture that honors, prioritizes, and gets really good sleep. All right, my next tip. Healthy cell. It's our newest sponsor. Maybe you've heard one of the commercials that we've run. You've heard me talking about it already. I was super excited when they wanted to work together and they were excited to work with me because I understand how foundational sleep is. And that's probably one of my two favorite formulas from Healthy Cell. I took their focus blend before writing this episode and wow, it just it just flew out of me. And I find it so satisfying to feel sharp and to be able to whip my ideas out with clarity. So I love their focus and recall blend. They also have a REM sleep formula. So in terms of focusing, these are the types of tools and every little bit helps. I like it because it's over the counter. It's all natural. It's easy and it digests in their magical kind of gel form. It feels really good in my belly because sometimes my belly doesn't like certain supplements or certain things that goes inside. So many people go the route of medicating or supplementing for anxiety and for depression. I very much wonder if focusing on better sleep wouldn't help more than medicating the symptoms. If you want to try these formulas I'm talking about or get more information about Healthy Cell, you can go to HealthyCell.com, use our code BADASS, and you get 20% off your first order. All right, my final tip. I want to share some other herbs and supplements that I use, and I do pretty much keep a little private apothecary for me to use. I really like the empowerment of noticing how I feel and just helping support myself throughout the day. I think my inner child likes that too, that grown-up me is willing to tend to what she needs in such a way and give these all these little ways of just helping the day, our lives be a little easier, a little more focused, a little more productive, a little more creative, a little more moving the needle forward on all of our to-do list items. Rhodiola rosé is one of my favorite herbs. It tastes and smells rosy, just like the flower. 
it gives a lift. It's like taking a little bit of caffeine without that jittery caffeine feeling. It's something that if I have a coffee in the morning, I don't so much anymore. I typically have an Earl Grey tea. You can put it in your morning hot beverage, whatever that is, just a little dropper. I tend to use tinctures that come from the company Herb Farm, and we don't have any association with Herb Farm, but they are H-E-R-B-P-H-A-R-M. And that's a company that you can really trust to source the herbs appropriately so that you can trust that you're not getting snake oil. One of the reasons that I really love their company is because you can try so many different herbs and different blends for very, very low cost. Most of their offerings can be tried for 10 bucks or 15 bucks. And as highly sensitive people, we can really fine tune our needs and feel empowered about putting things in our bodies that work really well with our bodies instead of harshly with no negative side effects. I'm also a big fan of popping a vitamin B complex in the early afternoon, especially for women. There's a lot of science that backs that we need a lot of vitamin B. Vitamin B is water soluble, so it's constantly leaving our system. When I take a vitamin B complex in the early afternoon, it lifts my mood. It gives me energy. I don't feel jittery. I don't feel up. It doesn't impact my sleep that night. So when I have that feeling of, ooh, I kind of want another caffeine something something, it's such a beautiful swap instead of going for that afternoon caffeine to grab that afternoon vitamin B. Kava Kava is another herb that I really love. If you're in recovery, if you have given up alcohol, if you just want to minimize alcohol and are playing around with being sober curious, Kava is an herb that comes from the South Pacific. You typically see it twice. It's Kava Kava, K-A-V-A, K-A-V-A. I also use the tincture from Herb Farm. You just drop it in water and it looks like witch's brew. It gets a little smoky. So my inner child doesn't hate that either. It can taste a little tingly on the tongue and going down the mouth and that's not having an allergic reaction to it. That's how it feels. People in the South Pacific have been chewing the leaves of the kava plant basically since the beginning of time. It's something that calms for anxiety. Here in Denver, we have Kava Kava bars. So if you're in recovery and are trying to steer clear of alcohol, there's absolutely no alcohol offered in a Kava bar. So it's really interesting to go into some of those places and feel that vibe of people hanging out in a bar-like atmosphere, absolutely alcohol-free. There's also Kava tea. So it can be as simple as just brewing a cup of tea. And that's probably my final little tip. I am very intentional with the herbal teas that I am drinking. They feel cozy. So it feels like more than just a drink that I'm drinking. It's a little act of self-love wrapped up in that cup of tea. It's basically a meme, right? Of handing somebody a cup of tea is basically a way to say, I love you. I care about you. I want you to feel warm and cozy. So what an act of self-care to offer a cup of tea. Chamomile is really amazing. It's so calming. It's so anti-inflammatory. Ladies, it's something I drink a lot around my cycle. It helps with that puffiness, that inflammation that our cycles can bring on so easily. Peppermint tea is another tea that I just always want to keep on hand if, if my tummy is rumbling, if anything just feels a little sour, a little upset, whether that's about something I ate or maybe a, a, an anxiety I'm having, that peppermint tea is so calming and helps with digestion. Ginger tea is something else. Ginger is great for nausea. It's great for calming. So if I'm sick, I very much love to have a ginger tea for a sore throat with some lemon and honey. And when we feel better, when we're taking better care of ourselves, that tea as a gift becomes its own little meditation, its own ritual. 
So I hope that you can also hear how these things that I suggested, they all play off of each other. It's been so clear to me for a very long time in this profession that it's never just one thing that helps us figure ourselves out. It really is this combination. I am spacing on the book that I pulled this from, but I know some of you out there will know. Maybe you can let me know on Instagram. There's this concept of just allowing ourselves to be 1% better, to improve by 1%. And if we have that mindset day in and day out in our self-care, in our productivity, in our focusing, in taking bigger, fuller, more frequent, deeper breaths, that's really where we make massive gains. When it comes to something like focus, this world is pushing and pulling against us and pulling us off our center so constantly. It really is in these almost insignificant practices that when we add them up, when we work them into our lifestyle, we can cultivate a more focused, more creative lifestyle and way of being. And if you were a creative being with a lot of ideas, with a lot of passion, if you had a tough childhood, this is its own sort of honoring self-care, self-love, and ultimately self-respect for this one precious life. So light, love, and more focus and creativity for all of us. I want to spend a few moments thanking those of you who very much help out the show. Y'all work that funky iTunes algorithm that nobody knows is a bit of a mystery. We don't really know how it works as podcasters. But when you give a five-star review, you do work that algorithm and you Make this show, you put emotional badass in front of other people. And when people are searching for self-development, you know it. Y'all have been there. It's probably how you found the show in the first place. You're just searching and searching and searching in that bar for the thing that'll help you figure a bit of yourself out to bring more peace, to bring more ease, to bring more understanding. So those of you who support our show by getting on iTunes and writing those five-star reviews, thank you because we get messages every day about people who find the show, who realize they're highly sensitive and their lives are getting better and they feel unalone. I want to thank Mr. Shill 2010. They wrote a review saying, thank you. Your show on hypervigilance and perfectionism is exactly what I needed to hear today. I literally just broke down crying yesterday, trying to explain to my husband how I've been feeling but not being able to find the words to describe it. Then I heard this podcast and I knew exactly that this is it. Thank you for what you do. You are so welcome. I want to thank 99 Allison 99 with one L. She says the show is life changing. This podcast has helped me discover so many things about myself. Let me know I'm not alone and been a vital tool in my healing journey. I'm a Reiki master and spiritual healer, and this podcast has helped me become a better healer and pass on so much valuable information to my clients. Spirit speaks through you so beautifully and fluently. Thank you for doing your own healing to be able to get to the point of creating this podcast. You are helping so many people heal. Big heart. Thank you so much. And I want you to know that the voices in my head As much as I've turned down that volume on that critical voice, they still poke out their little heads sometimes and they will try to tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about or I don't know anything. So I want you to know that no matter how much I work, I have to also accept that because that was my original programming, that voice may be able to poke its little head out maybe all the days of my life. And in the acceptance of that, I don't have to fight that. I just know that I don't have to listen anymore when it pokes up that critical BS. Thank you for the acknowledgement and thank you for taking what I'm offering and passing it forward. It is the greatest gift of my life to have gotten into this profession and to see, feel the butterfly effect that is so, so real. All of you out there doing your healing, even if you're not in some kind of healing profession, you are affecting just by changing your energy, by becoming more grounded and centered, more self-respecting and self-loving, you are changing how you interact with everyone around you, your friends, your family, 
but all the random people you run into and work with too. Thank you for being out there taking care of yourself. That's truly how we change the world by doing our healing one person at a time. All right, I'm going to do one more, one more today. H A W. Let's see. I don't know how to say that. That's a bunch of letters put together just to write this for us. Thank you so much. They say, thankful. I am so thankful I found your podcast. You truly have a gift. Thank you for opening up and sharing. You are so, so, so very welcome. All right, y'all. Light and love, focus, creativity. And I will see you right here next time for a next episode. I am an emotional badass. You are an emotional badass. And together we are where Moxie meets mindful, light and love. Bye-bye.